Hey Flower Tribe, it's Kelly Lehman from Cranberry Fields Flower Farm and I wanted to take you on a short, quick, mini April garden tour in my spring garden. Uh, I promise you I will make you a longer, more detailed one, but I'm actually shooting this from like my little back porch and it was so beautiful. I wanted to make sure that I can share it with you guys before, you know, all these blooms start to disappear on some of these flowering trees and on some of the flowers that are in my April garden. So here it is, it's the end of April in my New Jersey Planting Hardiness Zone 6 garden. And I wanted to show you uh, what's what, at least from the porch, because I've got some good uh, internet here, so I could do some better streaming up here sometimes than I can from my garden. So uh, let me tell you the who's who. I am a huge fan of flowering trees, and the big mama right in front of me is a crab apple tree. It's got these beautiful, beautiful, white fluffy blossoms on them and they'll stay here for a few weeks and eventually once they fade they'll fall to the ground and it's just beautiful to see this when it's actually falling to the ground because it looks like little like fairy like little fairy wings everywhere and uh then the leaves turn like this beautiful green and uh that's pretty much you know like like the focal point of the yard right now and we just have like a little rocking chair underneath it and it's just so peaceful to watch especially you know, when it's raining out and, and when the wind's there, it's just really so beautiful. So um, let me know if any of you guys have any flowering trees or if that's something you'd like to learn more about. Let me know that in comments. Uh, that would help so much. And also, if you don't mind, let me know where you're viewing this from. I love to see uh, how our flower tribe is growing around the world each week. I mean, you guys are all over the place. There's thousands and thousands of our flower tribe, and I love when you check in and let me know where you're watching from and what the weather's like by you. And uh, yeah, let me know if you want to learn more about these flowering trees. So I'll tell you more about some of the ones in the back here. Uh, to the back right, there is like a beautiful, it's called the Kwanzan cherry tree. And so that's the one all the way to the right. And then the one a little bit to the left of that is a dogwood. And I'm having, I'm trying to zoom in a little bit more, but I don't know. Oh, here, here we go. Hello. Okay, so the one to the right, so you have, you know, this ornamental white flowering tree to the right. Then the next one is a Kwanzaan cherry, which is spectacular. And when I do my other garden tour, I will show you, you know, like more close-ups of what the blooms and the blossoms look like. It looks like giant carnations just blooming on a tree. And that's probably, I, I think that might be my favorite flowering tree back there. And then next to that is a pink dogwood. Uh, my mother always loved dogwood trees. She always had either a pink one or a white one in the front of her house in Long Island. So uh, that's very near and dear to me. And so let's see. Oh, you're viewing from, uh, from Florida. Oh, hey, Florence, how are you? Yeah, my, actually, my dad lives in Florida. And so next to that dogwood tree, there's like a purple tree in the back, and that's actually a red bud tree. Even though it's purple, it's in the back of this green one. It's called a red bud tree, and it's, it's really pretty. Like the color purple is just striking on that. And so in the back, a little further to the left, you'll see like a weeping cherry. That's the weeper in the back. It's kind of pinkish white, and it's very romantic. You can tell it almost looks like a weeping willow. And that's usually like bright pink. So it's starting to lose some of its blossoms right now, but it's still just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful tree. And then in front of that is a, a white lilac, and that one's coming into bloom right now. And then I've got a whole bunch of daffodils. Those are the yellow flowers that you see in the front of my garden. And uh, my gardening tip for your daffodils is that you should um, wind up cutting the blooms out of them once they start to fade. And you can you can go right, find that flower, go right down on the stem all the way to like the base of the plant and just cut that whole stem out. But leave the rest of the leaves in place because your daffodils need to feed themselves for the rest of the season and they need to kind of store that energy for the winter so that they come back. And every three or four years, you can divide your daffodils because the bulbs start to multiply. So you can kind of dig them up and you know, kind of cut them, separate them, and you can replant them and you can have like, you know, double the blossoms, you know, from the same plant and it just keeps multiplying uh, year after year. So that's my little daffodil tidbit. And also, I'm not sure if you guys know, but daffodils have uh, something inside of them called lycorine that animals hate. So uh, the deer and the rabbits will usually avoid your daffodils because they don't want to get a stomach ache from ingesting this lycorine that's in the stems of the plant. It's also in the leaves and the flowers of the plant. And so a lot of gardeners will also plant 
flowers like daffodils and marigolds in the front of their garden beds because uh, animals also don't like marigolds. So they kind of get deterred from your garden by that first line of defense. And it's, a lot of times they'll wind up leaving it alone. Over here, a little closer to the house, I've got the first plant on this side of the fence is a limelight and I kind of cut that one I cut the whole top off of that one because it got very scraggly. It got very kind of bushy with just little tiny blooms on these little thin, thin spindly stems. And I usually don't prune back my limelight hydrangea, uh, but this one I did because it was just getting too, like I said, spindly and the blooms were tiny. So that's what I did with that one. I've got two mop head hydrangeas next to it that were also pruned back, but I didn't prune that back this time of year because there's a lot of buds that are coming up on that old wood. So those were uh, pruned back last year and just a little cleanup this year. And then I've got a rose bush and I've got a giant row of Annabelle's in back of that, but it's hard to see that right now. And then, um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, okay. So we did a whole bunch of mulch in the garden. And here's the story with mulch, guys. You do not have to mulch every single year. Uh, I'll mulch my garden like every maybe two or three years. And the way that I determine whether or not I'm going to mulch is I reach down and I pick up some of like the little wood chips in my hand. And if they're still wood chip looking, like, you know, if they're still chunky, I leave it alone. But if I find that those wood chips have broken down and they feel like soil, that means that they are the perfect planting bed for weeds because they've broken down. They're almost like, you know, like compost. They're turning into, you know, they're getting into almost like a soil-like material. And as the weed seeds are kind of, you know, blowing around the garden, they're gonna wind up planting themselves in that old mulch. So make sure that you have fresh mulch in the garden, you know, if that mulch had started to break down because otherwise, mulch is supposed to protect your garden from the weeds. It's supposed to tamp them down and keep the sunlight off of them. And it's a really great defense against weeds. But once it starts breaking down, it turns you know, from being like the enemy of the weed to being the weed's best friend. And I'm making you guys a, a great video on some of the things that I do here at Cranberry Fields Flower Farm to keep all the weeds at bay. And I will I'll you know put that up pretty soon. I'll let you guys know when that's live. And um, yeah, so that's it for now, guys. So here's just like the mini, like the mini tour. Like I said, I'm going to give you a much more elaborate one, but I just wanted to make sure I kind of checked in today and showed you uh, what this is looking like before I start losing some of these blooms. And this, this is actually my limelight hydrangea straight ahead. If you see that black arch to the left of it is one of my other big giant mama limelight hydrangeas. And that one I do give a little bit of a haircut to, a little bit of a pruning. Uh, but the other limelights uh, at, at my place, I did not give a pruning to. And some Flower Tribe members have asked me about fertilizing this time of year. Yes, it's okay to fertilize your hydrangeas as long as they're kind of established. I have, I know you can't see this, but I've got three or f I've got four incredible hydrangeas against this fence where that snow shovel is. I was using some, I was using the snow shovel, believe it or not, to lay some of that mulch, but I've got three baby Incredibles that Proven Winners Color Choice had sent me, and I just planted them last year. So I'm not going to prune them back. When I planted them, I did not fertilize them. So it's kind of important, guys, that when you're planting like your hydrangeas, you're planting your roses, you don't want to fertilize them when you're planting them because you want your plants to worry about root development. You don't want it to worry about like pushing forth tons and tons of green leaves and beautiful blooms that first year. So when I planted these Incredible Hydrangea, I did not fertilize them. I just, you know, I, I dug a hole that was uh, about two times the size of, uh, of the pot, like the width of it, and the same height, because you always want to make sure that you plant your hydrangeas and your roses, uh, where they're just like the same height as the ground or a little bit higher. You never want to plant them lower. And that's what I did. I just kind of filled it in. I put a little mulch around them, but I didn't fertilize. But the rest of your hydrangeas, you can fertilize in the spring with like a slow release. I know a lot of people like to use either like a rose food, believe it or not. I know some Flower Tribe members like to use Holly Tone. So um, I, I don't use that much fertilizer with my hydrangeas. A lot of them are just blooming beautifully and a lot of people tend to over fertilize their hydrangeas. So if you've been getting beautiful blooms 
and your hydrangea is looking very healthy, you might, wa you might want to consider not fertilizing it at all. Sometimes less is more. Uh, but some of you, you know, who do need to fertilize, yes, this is a good time of year to do it. Just don't, don't do overkill. You know, don't fertilize it now and then fertilize it, you know, three weeks from now because you can actually burn the plant with too much fertilizer. So that's the fertilizer story. And um, yeah, so that's the story. I, like I said, I'll give you guys some more tips and more, like, more close-up views of some of these plants. I'm actually working on a video for you guys right now. Proven Winners Color Choice has sent me over four uh, amazing roses, and I'm gonna post that hopefully either later today or tomorrow because I wanna show you some of the new stuff that they have coming out. And I think you're gonna like these guys, they're really pretty. Uh, but that's it, if you guys have any garden questions, please leave them in comments below. I have a podcast out now and I'm getting all of my podcast material from the questions that the Flower Tribe is, is asking. So any questions that you have about, you know, hydrangeas, roses, peonies, sunflowers, you name it, I will try to, you know, tackle as many as I can. And if you're interested in listening to a garden tip uh, podcast, that is in descriptions below. It's called Gardening Flowers with Kelly Lehman. And Mother's Day is coming up, guys. Uh, not this Sunday, but the following. And if you're stuck for a Mother's Day gift and you know that your mom likes to garden, I've got a few really fun online flower courses that show you how to grow amazing fresh cut flowers in your own backyard. They're really simple, easy videos to follow. Um, and you can check that out in descriptions below what my online flower course is and they're really easy to gift. You can just put the person's email in and they get a nice easy email and you can open up the course and then they can start, you know, watching the course and, and I think that, um, you know, it might be something fun for the gardeners in your life. So that's the story guys. Okay, listen, I will see you guys in the next video and in case you're uh, wondering where Lucy is, she's right in back of me. So let me just, she's on her little coffee break here. I don't want to wake her up. <laughs> But yeah, she's always within five feet of me. <laughs> all right, Flower Tribe. Listen, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate all of you. Oh, and also hop on over to our Kelly Lehman's Flower Tribe Facebook group because there's thousands and thousands of gardeners from all over the world, and they're asking and answering tons and tons of garden questions over there. So I will see you guys in the next video. Oh, and if you like this, give me a thumbs up if you don't mind. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Bye.